Welcome to the InfoWars Nightly News. It is Tuesday, September 20th, 2016, and I'm Leanne McAdoo. Here's what's coming up tonight. Tonight, following the recent terrorist attacks in New Jersey and New York, globalist George Soros says he wants to invest $500 million to help Syrian refugees. Meanwhile, Hillary Clinton says she will welcome Muslim refugees with open arms if she becomes president. Then, former U.S. President and head of the CIA, George Bush Sr., says he's voting for his daughter-in-law, Hillary Clinton. Plus, CNN, the Clinton News Network, strikes again. This time, editing Donald Trump out of context to push his Islamophobic narrative to the brainwashed masses. All that plus much more up next on the InfoWars Nightly News. Some top immigration officials in the Obama administration are calling him out today, saying once again he has picked the U.N. over America in his push for 110,000 more refugees. Now, this is Senator Sessions. He's saying that he, he decided to snub the Senate hearing. This is a statutorily required Senate hearing. He, he was well aware in advance that this was planned. Uh, it was planned for the Refugee Admissions Program in fiscal year 2017. They want to go ahead and talk about this. The American people deserve to know. But what does Obama want to, want to do? He wants to go huddle in New York with the United Nations refugee proponents. And so he called him out, Session said, despite having sufficient notice of this, American people, they want to know what's going to be happening. Um, but you decided to go ahead and subordinate both your relationship with Congress and the legitimate concerns of the American people to advance the agenda of the United Nations. And, of course, part of that agenda, as we can see, George Soros is here with his hands in it. On Monday now, the U.N. opened its first summit addressing the current refugee uh, and migrant crisis. So the U.N. and UNICEF calculate that a record 65 million people have been forcibly displaced from their homes in 2015 alone. Mostly they're coming from Syria, Afghanistan, and Somalia. George Soros is going to invest $500 million of his own money to help the refugees. So this is billionaire investor George Soros. He's had his hands in this all along. But now he has pledged another $500 million. Once these refugees get on to their host communities, he's going to invest in startups, established companies, social impact initiatives and businesses started by migrants and refugees. These investments are intended to be successful, but our primary focus is to create products and services that truly benefit migrants and their host communities. So here we are, problem, reaction, solution, create this crisis, and now he's going to invest in all sorts of companies that are going to take over uh, the landscape of whatever countries these people are being uh, brought into much like uh, they're going to bring Syrians in to reshape Detroit. Forget about the people who have been living a below poverty level in Detroit for quite some time, begging for some assistance. Eh, they don't even care about you. You're just going to be replaced with Syrian refugees. They're going to give them the homes, then the jobs. It's incredibly awesome. Now, take a listen to this incredibly stupid question posed to Hillary Clinton from a Bloomberg reporter. Um, are you concerned that this weekend's attacks or potential incidents in the coming weeks uh, might be an attempt by ISIS or ISIS sympathizers or really any other group, maybe the Russians, um, to influence the presidential race in some way uh, and presumably try to drive uh, votes to Donald Trump, who is, as you've said before, widely seen as perhaps being somebody who they would be more willing to or see as an easier person to be against? A Russian plot to help Trump. What a stupid question. So stupid she couldn't even pose the question. It didn't even come out of her mouth properly. Now, if I was a conspiracy theorist, I might say it was probably more so uh, the U.S. that would do this. Because once again, we see the bomber had ties to the CIA's al-Awlaki. Uh, these were, this was according to a manifesto that was found on Romani. It made mention of the Boston Marathon bombing as well as Yemeni American cleric Anwar al Olaki. So Olaki is a known CIA and FBI asset who dined at the Pentagon shortly after 9-11. 
He directly inspired the Chattanooga shooter, the Fort Hood shooter, the underwear bomber, and the Charlie Hebdo terrorist. And that's not all. Once again, uh, the bomber was known to the FBI. In fact, uh, two years before this took place, uh, his father actually warned the FBI that his son was a terrorist. This was in response to a domestic violence call, um, which led to Ahmad's arrest for stabbing his brother. The FBI Joint Terrorism Task Force in New Jersey opened up an assessment investigation on him, but his father later recanted his claim. Uh, but, you know, he, they, he also was going through secondary screenings because he made several trips to Afghanistan and Pakistan. They had suspicions he might have been radicalized abroad, so they take him in for secondary screening. Then he goes back again, and they think, well, he's been visiting these Taliban uh, areas, so then maybe he got radicalized, radicalized again. So he goes into a second, to secondary screening. I mean, you know, it's got the whole false flag on it everywhere. But either way, this was a great distraction from the day that the U.S. became ISIS's air force. Now here's a very revealing article on Infowars.com, how the U.S. became ISIS's air force. Now this article was written by Syrian girl who's a geopolitical expert about the Syrian civil war. And she pointed out the recent U.S. Air Force strike on a Syrian army base that killed 80 Syrian soldiers and wounded up to 100. It occurred in a region of Syria that has always been under control by the Syrian government. It's never been under control by ISIS. So she pointed out that CENTCOM released a statement claiming that they had bombed these positions in the past, a statement which is demonstrably false. Now, we've known for the past several years the Obama administration has openly funded and armed ISIS. And we saw in 2012 the leaked Pentagon document that pointed out the West, particularly the State Department under Hillary Clinton, was supporting ISIS, which was al-Qaeda of Iraq and Syria at the time and its proxy war against Syria and, by extension, Russia. And then we also saw in 2015, President Obama signed an order to ship guns to so-called moderate Syrian rebels. But since at least 2013, the rebels in Syria have all been linked to ISIS, with several of them being interviewed by Middle Eastern reporters claiming that, yes, we've, we've pledged allegiance to ISIS. We're working together to topple Assad. And of course, the Obama administration dropped leaflets on ISIS militants, warning them of an upcoming airstrike 45 minutes prior. So this, this article reveals something that we've known for quite some time. The Obama administration is openly arming and funding ISIS, and President Obama can practically be called the founder of ISIS. This is Kit Daniels with InfoWars.com, and to find out more stories and breaking news, download the free InfoWars Live app, available now for Android and iPhone at InfoWars.com forward slash app. So now this suspected New York, New Jersey bomb maker was apparently a Trump hater. So of course, this is going to be seized upon by Hillary Clinton, who likes to say that Donald Trump's rhetoric inspires terrorism, terror attacks, but apparently uh, Ahmad Romani posted several anti-Donald Trump memes and videos about the plight of Syrian children living with military airstrikes. So, you know, perhaps he wasn't so uh, happy with the fact that the U.S. became ISIS's air force in Syria just the day before. Uh, but, of course, Hillary Clinton is going to say that this is just further proof that Donald Trump incites terror attacks. Um, but it's actually kind of interesting because the terrorists don't like Donald Trump and they like Hillary Clinton much like Omar Mateen's father, who was seen sitting behind Hillary Clinton at one of her rallies, like smiling the entire time, saying, yay, Hillary is great for America. Um, also, like Mr. New World Order himself, George H.W. Bush, he is actually going to buck his party's presidential nominee and vote for Hillary Clinton. This is according to a member of the Kennedy family who said, you know, George H.W. Bush is going to vote for Clinton because she's going to Get it done, that New World Order agenda that these these families have been planning. Clinton is going to be the one to get it done. CNN is going to make sure of that because they are all in alignment with pushing this propaganda. Here's some more deceptive editing we can tell you about. So they falsely quoted Do Donald Trump during a Monday evening broadcast. He's literally speaking on the screen and saying um, what Israel has done an unbelievable job. They'll profile, they'll profile. They see somebody suspicious, they'll profile. They take that. And they'll take that person in. Well, as he's saying these words underneath the quote that ran underneath the header, Trump says racial profiling will stop terror. 
But Trump never said the words racial in relation to profiling. The same thing happened later with Bill O'Reilly on the topic. He didn't use the word racial at all whatsoever. So this is just the type of programming that we can see coming out of CNN because this this term racial profiling is a major hot topic right now uh, with all the killings and this anti-police um, activity going on around the country. This racial profiling, it's a weaponized word. It's a hot button. And that is why CNN is deceptively editing it to program people to hate Donald Trump. But I want to give a kudos to all the citizen journalists that are out there. Now, Reddit users appeared to uncover this two-year-old post from Hillary's uh, IT guy um, there on Reddit. He was asking, you know, how to wipe the server. Well, now the House panel is actually going to be looking into that Reddit post about Clinton's email server. So good job, guys. We win again. A terrorist attack expected in October. This article up on Infowars.com. A Princeton professor, he told CNN, expect an October surprise uh, heading the election, a national security crisis to unfold in the coming weeks, and people are going to have to adjust their campaigns to deal with it. Of course, he's talking about Clinton and Trump. He's saying that bad actors, politicians wanting to sway the election, the electorate their way, are going to plan an attack. This is what he told CNN. Uh, this could take on one of two forms, a large-scale Islamic terror attack on U.S. soil, which would directly benefit Trump, or a military escalation with, with Russia, which would certainly benefit Clinton, because Hillary could then claim that Trump has been cozying up to Putin. So he's saying that these third-party organizations are going to do something that's going to try to sway the electorate. We can expect it, possibly a terrorist attack on our soil. This news coming as one globalist throws his support behind Hillary Clinton, George H.W., of course, that's who I'm talking about. He's saying, look, he's 92 years old. He's going to support Clinton. There's a shocker right there. The globalist uniting against, for Clinton, anti-Trump. He joins another voice that's anti-Trump, the New York City bomber, Ahmed Khan Rahman. Tommy. He's saying that he's anti-Trump. He has a long social media presence online bashing Trump and his supporters. And he's joining Bush in the support for Clinton. That's the presumption, because if you're anti-Trump, the presumption is that you're pro-Clinton. This news coming as Obama is visiting the U.N., pushing that global economy. It's good to know that the globalists and the terrorists are all supporting Clinton, at least online. We've got this article up. I encourage you also to take a look at our new app, Infowars.com. You can download it for free on your iTunes App Store. I'm Margaret Hal reporting for Infowars.com. The United Nations General Assembly in New York City spent the day painting a rosy picture around the autocratic nightmare known as Agenda 2030. In this great hall, the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development was adopted. With its 17 Sustainable Development Goals, the agenda is hugely ambitious. Imbued with a universal and transformative spirit, the agenda sets out as a master plan for us to transform our world to one in which extreme poverty has been eliminated and peaceful, well-governed societies live sustainably and in harmony with our environment. During the 71st session, I am committed to a universal push for implementation of all 17 Sustainable Development Goals. And then President Obama stepped up to the New World Order podium for his final love fest of himself as the President of the United States. As if speaking into the vacuum of space, Obama lectured the international body of globalist banking pawns with half-truths and grandiose ideas, still promising big things after eight years of diligently checking off the multinational corporation's to-do list at the expense of any real hope or change benefiting the citizens of the United States. We have made international institutions like the World Bank and the International Monetary Fund more representative while establishing a framework to protect our planet from the ravages of climate change. We see too many governments muzzling journalists and quashing dissent and censoring the flow of information. In medicine and in manufacturing and education and communications, we're experiencing a transformation of how human beings live on a scale that recalls the revolutions in agriculture. The existing path to global integration requires a course correction. And as these real problems have been neglected, Alternative visions of the world have pressed forward, both in the wealthiest countries and in the poorest. Religious fundamentalism, the politics of ethnicity or tribe or sect, aggressive nationalism, a crude populism, sometimes from the far left but more often from the far right, which seeks to restore what they believe was a better, simpler age 
free of outside contamination. These are the policies that I've pursued here in the United States and with clear results. American businesses have created now 15 million new jobs. After the recession, the top 1% of Americans were capturing more than 90% of income growth, but today that's down to about half. Last year, poverty in this country fell at the fastest rate in nearly 50 years. A society that asks less of oligarchs than ordinary citizens will rot from within. That's why we've pushed for transparency and cooperation in rooting out corruption and tracking the illicit dollars. Because markets create more jobs when they're fueled by hard work and not the capacity to extort a bribe. That's why we've worked to reach trade agreements that raise labor standards and raise environmental standards, as we've done with the Trans-Pacific Partnership, so that the benefits are more broadly shared. Meanwhile, just outside the doors of the United Nations building in Manhattan, the true impact of Obama's policies basked in stark reality, as the number of black food stamp recipients has risen 58.2% under Obama, a stagnant GDP growth of 2.4% in 2015 froze any economic growth, and the national debt ticked away incessantly, as it essentially doubled under Obama's spending spree on global initiatives and the prerogatives of of other nations. And while more possible radical jihadist terrorists pour into small cities across the United States, like Missoula, Montana, and Charleston, West Virginia, billionaire Obama and Hillary Clinton supporter George Soros adds more insult to injury by announcing a donation of $500 million to keep the destabilization of civilization on an even keel. CNBC reported, the 86-year-old George Soros said in an official statement, We will invest in startups, establish companies, social impact initiatives, and businesses started by migrants and refugees. Will the unemployed coal miners be working for the refugees now? John Bound for InfoWars.com. It's my privilege and honor to be joined by Reverend Jesse Lee Peterson today. Jesse Lee Peterson is the author of The Antidote. Healing America from the Poison of Hate, Blame, and Victimhood. His YouTube channel is The Fallen State, founder of Bond, RebuildingTheMan.com, also contributes to WND.com. His resume is amazing. Reverend Jesse Lee Peterson, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for having me on. It's an honor to be with you. I appreciate it. Yeah, and you've been really busy. You're going around talking about your book. I think that uh, you're becoming more popular. <laughs> I am. Thank God. You know, the book, The Antidote, Healing America from the Poison of Hate, Blame, and Victimhood is a book that I wanted to write for a long time. I've written several other books, but this is the one that I wanted to write because anyone who reads the book would be able to get help from the book. And what we prove with the antidote is that there is no such thing as racism. Racism has never existed. It's a lie that's been made up by the race hustlers. It's an illusion. And that's why we have not been able to end the so-called racism because we are trying to solve a problem that doesn't exist. Uh, black Americans are suffering not because of racism, but the destruction of the family and the lack of moral character. Black people are angry because their fathers and mothers have let them down. And instead of dealing with that and forgiving their parents, they have been told by the race hustlers that is the white man, that is so-called racism. And that's why this thing is getting worse rather than getting better. Talk about your motivations for writing this book and for publishing it right now. Well, you know, since Barack Obama has been in the White House, things have gotten worse rather than better, and especially between the races. Barack Obama has used this idea of racism in order to further his socialist agenda. He want to change America as we know it. And so he is uh, blame white police officers. He blame white people. He's often, oft, oftentimes talking about the so-called Jim Crow era when none of that exists. And what I've noticed is that even the younger black kids are, are angry now at white Americans. We have seen it by way of the knockout games. We have seen black people rob and kill white Americans across the country. 
We are now seeing them attacking police officers by way of, uh, uh, by influence of so-called Black Lives Matter. And we all know that Black Lives Matter is an evil, agitative uh, organization that is worse than the KKK. And yet, Barack Obama meet with them because they all agree. And I'm concerned that if we don't do something to stop this evil, that things are going to get so bad in our country that it will take a long time to overcome it. I'm concerned that we will eventually have a race war on our hands, and I don't want that to happen. You know, and speaking of Black Lives Matter, it was actually your interviews with Black Lives Matter is what drew me to your YouTube channel to begin with. Um, I th Go I'm not sure which one houses. you did first, but you had one with Patrice Marie Khan Calors, where she just ran away from you when you tried to have a, a political conversation or a, a, a conversation talking about race relations in America. She just went up and hung up. She didn't want to say she liked capitalism or denied she was a, a communist. And then <laughs> uh, right. you had uh, you had two more um, younger activists for Black Lives Matter that you were interviewing that they couldn't figure out what else they uh, they were having issues with besides their hair. And then I guess it was I don't know if it was someone that was with them or somebody else that was just in your audience decided they were going to get up and leave. They were so offended. What what has it been like dealing with the psychology of this? Because people say that I am amazing how I keep my cool when I'm out on the streets. You are like Yoda, my friend. How do you how do you deal with the psychological operations w when dealing with these people? Well, I do want to tell you, the woman that was in the audience during the Black Lives Matter uh, interview was one of the founders of Black Lives uh, matter here in the LA area. So she got, she became, I mean, just, as you saw, just out of control. Well, you know, I understand how those people feel because at one point I was on that side of the fence. I had anger in my heart, but, uh, and for a long time, I thought it was against white Americans because when I moved to California from LA, I, I mean, when I moved to California from Alabama, I was told by the black preachers and Jesse Jackson and Louis Farrakhan and others, that it was the white man trying to hold me down because I'm black. And so I started to hate white Americans for that because I believed into that lie. And as we all know, once you become angry at someone, at yourself or someone else, you can no longer see the truth. And whomever be, caused you to become angry also control you. And so if, you know, when someone came along and said, well, the white man is not, your problem, you need to forgive. You need to forgive your parents. I couldn't believe that because I couldn't see the truth. And it wasn't until I really examined myself and realized that my anger was from my parents, my mother who tried to turn me away from my father. And I had this yearning for my dad. You know, there was a void in my life, an emptiness. And it was for my father. And it wasn't until I was able to reconnect with him that I was fulfilled. And then I dropped the anger by forgiving them that I was able to see that it has never been the white man. It has never been racism. It was this anger I had toward my failing parents. And so when I deal with these people, I understand that they cannot see. They are angry at the failing of their parents. And then they're mad at the white man because the race hustlers have told them that the white man is trying to keep them down. So when they call me names, when they call me Uncle Tom and they hang up on me, I don't take it personally because I realize that they cannot see what they're doing. And I know that your website, rebuildingtheman.com, is dedicated towards trying to fix those issues. But uh, getting back to the interviews you did, I'm curious, what was the experience like for you? off the air, off the set? Because there was a time there where you were communicating uh, with your audience. You were like, hey, I'm sorry. I thought this would be a stimulating conversation. I, I can't get anything out of them. Um, yeah. They took that personally, but I understood where you were coming from. What was it like off the air? Were they ever hostile to you after? Were they were they nice to you before? Were they open-minded? And then it just everything went bad off uh, when you were on the air? What was the experience like off air? Well, when they first came in to uh, get ready for the interview, they were very nice. You know, they were talking and laughing and playing around. And then once we got on the set and I started to interview them, asking them serious questions, they became upset because they are not accustomed to black people not going along with them. They want you to blame it on white folks. They want you to blame it on, the, on someone else. And I was trying to get them to take responsibility for their own lives. 
That's what I asked, well, what do you want from white people? What can they do for you? And they don't like that kind of stuff because those type of questions, because it requires them looking at themselves and admitting that they are wrong and it has nothing to do with racism. So uh, once I started doing that, they became very angry. They started yelling and screaming. And at the end of the show, I mean, it was just, it was bad. They were yelling and screaming. And finally, they just ran out of the studio and got out of here <laughs> because they couldn't handle the truth. And not one time did I become angry at them because I know where they're coming from. They're wrong, but I also understand where they're coming from. Yeah, and that's why I consider you Yoda when you're handling these people. It's truly unbelievable. Hardly a day goes by when I don't get death threats, name calling. Um, you know, over the years, I've had guns drawn on me. I've been called Uncle Tom, sell out the N-word, just all kinds of things, you know. But, you know, I realized that the battle is not a physical battle. It's a spiritual battle. It's a warfare between good and evil, right versus wrong. And so I love what's right with all my heart, soul, and might. I love my country. I often tell folks that I'm not an African-American. I don't have an Afro. I have an Amerifro. There are no African drums beating in my chest. The American guitar is playing in my heart. Black as the ace of space. I grew up on a plantation down in Alabama under the Jim Crow laws, but I am 100% American. It's a blessing that I was born here and nowhere else. And I'm willing to stand up and fight for my country. I will not sit back and let some whining, complaining uh, people who are unwilling to take responsibility for themselves, I would not sit back and allow them to destroy the greatest country in the world. Do you mind if I get a little political with you? Please do. Yeah, uh, I love it. Do you mind sharing uh, with our audience who you plan on voting for in the upcoming election? I am absolutely, from day one, been stomping for Donald Trump, stomping for Trump. For my full interview with Reverend Jesse Lee Peterson, be sure to subscribe to the Alex Jones channel on YouTube. An article on InfoWars.com today talks about how hackers were able to control Teslas remotely from 12 miles away. But of course, this is a group of Chinese hackers and folks, 12 miles is nothing. It shows the vulnerable infrastructure that we're about to create with self-driving cars. Now, Today, we're not going to talk about the technology, even though we've talked about this many times in the past. We've talked about the vulnerability, the safety issues, as we've seen with the crashes with Tesla. We've also seen earlier this week, we've seen the feds come out and say that they're going to uh, work to set up autonomous car guidelines. Understand what's behind this. They say the states would continue to handle human aspects of operating a vehicle, such as licensing drivers, registering vehicles, etc. But federal officials are suggesting policy areas for states to consider with the goal of generating symmetry among the states for the testing of deployment of autonomous vehicles. So understand what this really is. This is what we've seen before with the Dark Act that was passed by Congress, signed by Obama, to shut down labeling of GMOs. We had state laws that were coming up. People were concerned. They wanted to know what was in their food. Uh, have the marketplace make the case that GMOs are safe, but we're not even allowed to know what is in our food. So the crony capitalists went to Washington. They said, we want you to shut down all these troublesome regulations throughout the states. And as the New York Times talk, calls that, they call that a patchwork of regulations. So instead, what they'll do is they'll shut down the Ninth and Tenth Amendment. They will dictate from, from Washington that you will not be allowed to have any laws to control safety on the roads. Isn't that interesting? Because we're told that we can't drive safely. Only the robot cars can drive safely. As the New York Times puts it, self-driving cars gain a powerful ally, the government. The government has always been an ally of these people who are pushing self-driving cars. And what is truly behind this is the same thing that has been pushing toll roads throughout the country, what's called a private-public partnership. And I want to look at one of these companies that is pushing this idea of self-driving cars, the idea that we're going to rent everything from a few multinational corporations who, through crony fascism, will coerce you to use their product to take away your freedom, to take away your ability to have any control over your transportation at the local level, to own anything as an individual. No, they will own everything. You will rent everything from them. And of course, Detroit is joining in this as well. I want to go through the rest of this report, look at what the co-founder and president of Lyft, John Zimmer, 
wrote about what he calls the third transportation revolution. I think it's very interesting because what he is selling us here is a combination, as I said before, crony fascism, and it's piggybacked onto Agenda 21. You see, what they want to tell us is that cities are wonderful. We should all live in cities. They are a socialist utopia. They're a community. We don't have real communities in rural areas or suburbs. No, it's only the cities that have real communities. And cars are the problem. Cars need to be eliminated. And they've been working at that for a very long time. But we can keep the cars as long as the government controls them and a few corporate cronies make all the profits from that. The real truth is that cities are the problem and that cars have been the solution. Now, it was Jefferson who told us hundreds of years ago, he said, cities are a threat to the health, the wealth, and the liberty of man. They always have been, and they always are. But let's take a look at what they're selling us with UN Agenda 21, with UN Agenda 2030, the plan for sustainable development, as they're telling us. And all this is being brought on, on schedule, 2020 and 2025. All of these people, all Uber, Lyft, GM, Ford, everyone is talking about that as being the time frame. But let's look at how he lays this out in his essay. First of all, he gives us the idea that ownership is not wanted. But I would say it is wanted by the younger generation. It just may not be possible. He brags that ownership of cars will go away just like DVDs within 10 years. He says teens don't want cars. And I would say, well, maybe they don't have the jobs and the independence that comes with the jobs economically to have a car. Here's what he has to say, though. He says the age of young people with driver's licenses has been steadily decreasing ever since right around the time that he was born. In 1983, he said 92% of 20 to 24-year-olds had driver's licenses. In 2014, it was just 77%. So it went from 92 to 77%. In 1983, 46% of 16 year olds had licenses. Today, he said, it's 24%. All told, millennials today are 30% less likely to buy a car than someone from the previous generation. That's because teens used to have something called jobs. Those were jobs that were entry level, they were minimum wage, they were training jobs. Those jobs have been taken by foreign adults who have come in through the open borders because of the corporatists who brought this in. And of course, the other thing that they've done, I think this is very key, this is the way they're gonna take cars away from us. They took them away from the teens by confiscatory insurance rates, saying you're dangerous, you're too dangerous to be on the roads, and by increased regulation. The same thing they're going to do to all humans to get us off of the road. He goes on to say, you can't really afford these things. He says, you're, you're spending $9,000 a year with your monthly payments, maintenance, gas, that sort of thing. That truly is not the cost. If you keep a car, and you can keep a car now, more than three to six years it takes to pay it off, you don't have that monthly payment every month. And that's really what is driving this economically, I think, for the car companies like GM and Ford. They have lost their model of profitability by making more and more reliable cars. Why did they make more reliable cars? Only because they had increased competition. That's the marketplace. But by making more reliable cars that last longer, they're not selling as many. So they're going to a completely different model of rental rather than selling cars. Now, he goes on to talk about the third revolution. Understand, he says, the first revolution in transportation was trains. And then we had a second revolution, cars. And then he proceeds to demonize cars as being the big problem. Here's what he has to say. At the very beginning of the, uh, the, the, the uh, blog that he put in, he said, this is a country that was built for cars. And again, I would say, from my perspective, it's been a country that has been freed by cars. Freed to move about, free to grow economically as well, but also free to get out of the cities, okay? To live where you wish. He says the average vehicle, and here's his main thesis that he keeps coming back to all the time. They're not used all the time. He said they're parked, uh, for, they're only used for 4% of the time, parked for 96% of the time. Again, we come back to the idea, why are they parked? My car is waiting for me. If you're going to have 100% utilization of that resource, then that means that you are going to be waiting for them. And that will happen when they have a monopoly or a duopoly system. The other thing he points out, as he says, the second transportation revolution caused communities to spread farther and farther apart, which made having constant access to a car increasingly necessary, resulting in even more cars that needed even more space. The point, though, is that decentralization is not a bug, as he puts it out. They're a problem that needs to be fixed. It is a solution, a solution to the cities. 
his utopian version of the way cities used to be, a revisionist historical uh, position on cities, he paints them this way. He says, streets used to be where children could play. They used to be a place for shopping where you could stop at a cart on the way home to pick up everything from dinner ingredients to shoes for your family. People spend a lot of time outside on the street making friends, seeing neighbors, and living their lives within a true community. Uh, maybe he hasn't ever read anything from Charles Dickens. Maybe he <laughs> has never seen what cities were truly like in the 1700s, in the 1800s, in the 1900s before cars were invented. You know, I'm not just calling bull on this, I'm calling horse shit. And let me tell you, when we go back and we look at what was really going on, look at the great manure crisis of 1894, okay? By the late 1800s, large cities all around the world were drowning in horse manure. In order for these cities to function, cities like New York had a population of 100,000 horses that produced about 2.5 million pounds of manure a day and 100,000 gallons of urine per day. Okay, the problems came to a head in 1894 when the London Times predicted that in 50 years, every street in London will be buried under nine feet of manure. You know, they were saved from that fate by Henry Ford. And he not only gave us cars to move about freely, to move and to spread out communities, what they call sprawl, uh, what we call new suburbs. But he also created an engine of economic growth. Finally, what he says is the model is a hotel. He says you wouldn't want a hotel that is only utilized 4% of the time. Again, going back to his parking analogy. What he is selling you understand is that you should give up your home, that you should live in a hotel that is controlled by the government, that is owned by somebody like him, and you give up your house. That is the end game. That is UN Agenda 21, where the rest of the country is locked off to you, and you are locked into the cities. For InfoWars.com, I'm David Knight. And we can only realize the promise of this institution's founding to replace the ravages of war with cooperation if powerful nations like my own accept constraints. We've got an exclusive at Infowars.com. Leaked video shows Obama railing against white people during his very first trip to Kenya in his 20s. Margaret Howell joins me now. And from what we are able to see in the footage so far, not a lot has changed in Obama's worldview since he was a young man in, in his 20s. Now, this footage... Uh, is set to be released very soon. It's going to be released through the site WeSearcher, which is going to be crowdfunding the cost of releasing this video. They have to pay the private eye who was able to obtain the footage. Now, WeSearcher's Chuck Johnson exclusively revealed to InfoWars some of Obama's comments in the video. Uh, he says at one point he talks about being deeply saddened by a sense that whites are still superior in this country, uh, going on to talk about basically just white privilege. And you can see how his psychology and his worldview uh, hasn't really changed that much. Now, like I said, this footage is going to be released exclusively to Infowars.com as soon as they're able to raise the costs uh, to pay the private eye who has acquired this footage. Uh, but Margaret, it's, it's pretty telling. Uh, we can see the way that his presidency, a lot of people uh, have said, and this is just going to be further ammunition for them, that he really ran his presidency on racial division in this country. Of course he did. You know, his smug disdain and his arrogance for all things that are fake and phony, Leanna. The race division is just a part of his playbook. You know, I sincerely believe he hates this country. And, you know, for whatever reason, you know, he was allowed to have a certain amount of power at a certain time. And I was listening to Alex's show yesterday. Let's just hope that Hillary is in our judgment. But going back to his disdain for our country, he was at the U.N., of course, we know. And three days after terrorism attacks on our, on our own soil, U.S. soil, this is what he had to say. The world is safer today. And then he goes on to criticize our country and bash it 11 separate times in his speech. He talks about basically how we're lazy. America's ac excess of capitalism is part of the world's problems. And he goes on to praise the U.N. You'd think he were leader and head of, you know, president of the United Nations and not the U.S. Right. He clearly despises this country and... He's concerned, and he, he, what he's saying is we need a change of course. Well, buddy, you need a change of course. Thank God your time is limited. Well, he's already said that about America, and we see what's mm -hmm. happened. That He campaigned on the fundamental oh, the change. 
oh, the fundamental change, and we see how that went. But bashing us 11 times, and then he goes on to say, and I love, this was my favorite quote from him, we must reject any form of fundamentalism, except for yours, <laughs> um, any form of fundamentalism or racism or any belief in ethnic superiority that makes our traditional identities irreconcilable. And then he goes on to talk about um, the truism that globalism has led to a collision of, a collusion of cultures, a collision of cultures. Uh, I would say that the collision of cultures is between the archaic and the civilized, and he's trying to paint it in this fake race way. Guess what? You lost the uh, the word war here, buddy, and it's time to hang it up. But unfortunately, we see past him. It's easy to poke holes, but as you pointed out, he has never changed this stance. Right. Not once. It's a lot like Hillary Clinton, who was radicalized in her youth, mm -hmm. and to this day, she's still fundamentally wants to change this country. She does not like America, this idea of America, this big experiment that was America, and they both want to take it down. Why? Why are we electing these people? Why Why on earth would we elect another person who hates this country so much? Right. Well, the apologists got in line with the people that actually hate the country, and they were able to do it. But look, the UN, the refugee agenda, it is gunning for America. Make no mistake about it. We are in an all-out war, and they're framing this argument with words like racism and bigotry. But the truth is, that they're gunning for you and I, and it's an agenda to take us down. And I love it. So t t Hillary Clinton's comments regarding Donald Trump, he's saying that they're rec he's recruiting the terrorists because of his, of his insane statements. Meanwhile, the terrorists, like Rahami, is totally anti-Trump. Right. You know, it's, it does make, wrap your head around The Orlando that. shooter is behind Hillary Clinton <laughs> and uh, smiling and like, yay, Hillary, I love your message so much. It's oh, just man. for me. And of course, now we have Senator Jeff Sessions uh, really going off on Obama, saying once again, he picks the United <laughs> Nations over America. Oh, of course he there does. There is a statutorily required hearing that was supposed to take place this week um, on the immigration the refugee admissions program uh, in fiscal year 2017. But of course, this Senate hearing has now had to be postponed because he wants to huddle in New York with the United Nations mm -hmm. refugee proponents. Mm -hmm. And so he's saying, once again, you're choosing the UN agenda over the American agenda. And one of the things that uh, the president said while he was there, you know, he said, if we're honest, we understand that no external power is going to be able to force different religious communities or ethnic communities to go to coexist for long. And so we need to pursue the hard work of diplomacy, aim to stop this violence, and help, help people that are basically uh, able to see that those who are not like themselves as worthy of dignity and respect. So he wants to, he admits there's no way we can make this work. They're not going to be able to coexist. So we need to help the people who are willing to, you know, not throw people off buildings that aren't like them. Um, meanwhile, there's a refugee on trial for drowning six Christians who failed the faith test. So this was someone who was bringing a lot of refugees over on a boat and these Christians, they were praying and there was a, a heavy storm a wave started and it was rocking the boat and he blamed it on them praying. So he throws them all off in the water to die. Uh, then we all, but it's not even just that, even in Saudi Arabia with the house of Saud, uh, they're actually coming after their own uh, Muslims, basically making them have to, they're profiling anyone who wants to come and take this annual, um, this required trip, mm -hmm. uh, Taj. And so they, all Muslims have to do this at some point. And so now they're basically saying, you can't come here unless you're a Wahhabist, unless you have these extreme points of views. Otherwise, we're going to beat you, kick you, stomp on you. You're going to be subjected to bigotry, hatred. Right. Right? So it's like the religion of peace is saying this, Leanne. Right. Let's not forget apostasy in Saudi Arabia is a crime punishable by death. If you're trying, if you're caught trying to convert anybody to Christianity or anything other than Muslim, being a Muslim, uh, you are put to death immediately. And Obama's message, you know what? He doesn't mention for a second the 29 innocent victims that are covered with shrapnel wounds because of Rahami's bombs. They're forced to be tolerant. Meanwhile, mm -hmm. you know, we, we have literally people that despise this nation. He's bringing them in by the truckloads. And I just want to point out, I don't know if we touched on uh, the Somali migration. I know Alex talked about it yesterday. 8,600 alone in his in this fiscal year, which is a record number. They typically resettle in Minnesota. 99.6 percent are, of course, Muslim males between the ages of 14 and 50. So we're talking about a militant male population, and they're gunning for this country. But the 29 people covered with shrapnel, you guys need to learn how to be tolerant and just accept it, or you're a racist bigot, and you don't understand the fact that, uh, you know, there's more than one culture than yours, frankly. Right.
Well, and actually that was one of the angles that a local paper there, right after the stabbing happened mm -hmm. uh, at, at the mall, the thing was, you know, well, <laughs> is this due to uh, anti-refugee sentiment? They've been dealing with this for a long time. Basically making excuses for someone going out and slashing people in a mall. And if, if you look on my Twitter, I'm sorry about it, but I, I tweeted out some of those photos of these people that have these massive gashes in their body and we're being told by Clinton and, and Obama as this is happening, as they're getting their wounds sewn up, those gashes, that we need to be tolerant. And that's the big issue is that we're not being tolerant enough. Correct. And, you know, for let's just not forget all of the knife wounds and stabbings and murders that are covered up that are actually a form of terrorism. They try to paint them as either like lone wolves. They never actually call it what it is. But <laughs> take comfort in the fact this was Obama's last speech before the United Nations as president of the United States and his last failed attempt to push these lame policies, the same old tired rhetoric. He's not winning the war. As Hillary Clinton pointed out, there is an information war and they're losing it. And this just highlights that for me beautifully. That, you know, he's, he's such a little peon. Forgive mm -hmm. me, Leanne. This, this really upsets me what he's trying to do this country because I know you, I know your love for this nation. I know that we love this country. Our hearts are, are really for you. And it, it infuriates me to see him try to destroy it and kick it on his way out. You mentioned that 110,000 on his, on his last day of office, his last six weeks, he's trying to ram through as mm -hmm. much as he can to destabilize and create chaos in our societies. But oh, guess what? We're awake now. People are waking up to this. Mm -hmm. And, you know, nothing new, as you pointed out, the same old rhetoric. Right. And of course, snubs his nose at Congress once again, refusing to go to the, the statutorily required meeting about this whole refugee program that he's putting in place, trying to shove through the door at the last minute. A uh, good sign, though, Angela Merkel has actually signaled that she's going to be backing down from her open door refugee policy. They had a disastrous Berlin election. It was a total disaster there. She's saying, if I could go back in time, I'd, I'd rather be better prepared for the refugee crisis. Uh, she says she's never going to use her slogan again of, uh, you know, <laughs> sounds a lot like Hillary Clinton's stronger together. So it's a huge failure and it's going to be a huge failure for Hillary Clinton and Obama as well. Thank you so much, Margaret, and thank you all for tuning into the show tonight. We will see you here again tomorrow, 7 p.m. Central.